get a feel for what age levels I'm dealing with. So predominantly, I asked some of the parents that came in the grade levels of their child, because I think it's really always good for me to know the audience. <coughs> because as the reading supervisor and the English as a second language supervisor, um, I do supervise kindergarten through 12th grade, which is a very broad scope. So um, my job is really all encompassing. So do we have elementary parents as well here? Secondary? Secondary. Secondary, okay, elementary? Kindergarten. Kindergarten, okay. So we do have a, a myriad of grades in the room, which is really, really good. So I want to just stop and, and, and have you think for a minute. I'm not going to have you write anything down, but I want you to think, what do you already know or think you know about, or what have you heard about the Common Core? And does anybody want to share anything about what they've heard about the Common Core? I know we have a teacher in the room, too. Yes. Uh, we were told that the junior high parents that they need to pass these tests in order to graduate from high school. Yes, by uh, 2017 graduating class, students will need to pass some of these tests to actually graduate from high school. That is indeed correct. That is indeed correct. So that's one thing that we know. A lot of this is about testing. Anything else that we know about the common course? It's necessary for a common space of knowledge that people are moving, they're transient. They would go one state to the other. You can find a lot of variety. Just even in our Pennsylvania, you go from one school to another, you see a great variety. Exactly. It's a nice framework to have some basic things that everyone should know. Exactly. And that is part of the premise. You hit the nail right on the head. That is part of the premise. And you're going to see a little video clip that was done by AchieveTheCore.com. And I think they do a really good job of hitting exactly what you just said. It shouldn't matter a child's zip code whether that's a zip code that's in Pennsylvania or whether that's a zip code that's somewhere in Alaska or something, for their child's in second grade, whether they be in Alaska, whether they be in Pennsylvania or Minnesota or wherever they might be, they should be held to the same standards and we should be teaching the same things. And you're exactly correct that across the United States, we have a real range of what the expectations are and you're gonna see that laid out. So thank you for bringing those two points up, the testing and that. Anything else? about the Common Core in particular that you've heard in the news or anything that's kind of hitting you right now. I think districts are also addressing this in different ways because I'm going to be very, very frank with you. In 31 years in education, I've never seen so many things changing in education in really very short period of time. So there's an awful lot coming at us in education and a lot of Oops, I hate to say that we have to jump through. However, I believe that you look at the glass half full, and I see a lot of beauty in the Common Core. And I hope that when you leave here this evening, you'll have a little bit better understanding of some of the beauty of the Common Core for the standards and the rigor that that's bringing about. And not that we haven't had that in the past, but you're going to see in the one document that I share with you the spiraling of the curriculum because these core standards really begin at pre-K and they go up through 12th grade. And oftentimes it's not referred to as 12th grade, it's referred to as um, uh, college and career ready. So you'll see it sometimes listed as CCR, college and career ready. But it starts at pre-K. And so these standards begin with our very, very little population and spiral the whole way through. So today what I hope to do is just introduce you to the PA core standards. The state of Pennsylvania has just changed the name. And in some of the documents that you have in front of you and some of the documents that you are going to see here in this PowerPoint, you'll see that the name wasn't changed because on the website, the SAS website, which is the PDE's website, they haven't even changed it. And they still, in the state of Pennsylvania, have a lot in draft form. So I just want to make you aware that Pennsylvania has now adopted and said it's the PA core standards. And it was our superintendent, Dr. Beverly Martin, who just told me that. I think it was last week, was it? wasn't it, Dr. Davies? I think that they just changed the name. So that's what I hope to give you is just an overview of the standards. So as was pointed out, you can see in this map here, hello, you can see in this map here, the goldenrod colored states are all of the states that have thus far across the United States adopted the Common Core. And you can see right here, 
Alaska, Texas, Nebraska, and I think Minnesota. I think that's Minnesota up there. Um, these states that are in the orange color have not yet adopted them. But the state of Pennsylvania, bam, we are right on them. Okay, right on them. Now, what the state of Pennsylvania, and I don't want to get too complicated with this, but what the state of Pennsylvania did do is they adopted the Common Core, but they Pennsylvania eyed it. Okay, they did Pennsylvania eyed it, and it did complicate it for us just a little bit more in this state. Um, and that really has to deal with all the numbering and all of those things, and what would be called the nomenclature and things. So it complicated it a little bit for us, but we have been working through that as a district. <clears throat> so when you're thinking about the core standards, the PA core standards, the common core standards, I want you to realize that they're in the English language arts and in the area of mathematics. Okay, and I'm going to show you what those standards look like. But these are the two areas. And as I said, it's the PA core standards, which I've tried to highlight here because Pennsylvania just changed that. So what are the Common Core State Standards? The Common Core State Standards do set grade-by-grade -grade learning expect expectation for children, as I said, in pre-K through 12th grade, or that co uh, college and <coughs> career ready, in mathematics and English language arts. I'm going to show you a video here, because I think that this video very, very clearly describes for you the premise behind the Common Core, the why, the very important why, and why a state like Pennsylvania would go ahead and adopt these. So I'm going to show you this little video clip. And I'm not used to manipulating these things with my left, left hands. <laughs> Just bear with me here. Can you help? No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good here. I think I, I'm learning that I have some dexterity here with my left hand. Like it or not, life is full of measuring sticks. How smart we are, how fast we are, how well we can, you know, compete. But up until now, it's been pretty hard to tell how well kids are competing in school and how well they're gonna do when they get out of school. We like to think that our education system does that. But when it comes to learning what they really need to be successful after graduation, is a girl in your neighborhood being taught as much as her friend over in the next one? Is a graduating senior in, say, St. Louis as prepared to get a job as a graduate in Shanghai? Well, it turns out the answer to both of these questions is no. Because for years, states have been setting different standards for what students should know and be able to do at each grade level. That's making it too hard to know if our kids are really doing well enough overall and if they can really compete for a job someday. What we really need are clear goals. That's where the Common Core State Standards come in. They're like a total sea change in education. Consistent, strong, clear benchmarks for English language arts and math. Here's how it works. You can think of kindergarten through 12th grade like a giant staircase. Each step is a skill your child needs to learn before stepping up to the next one. But right now, too many kids aren't really confident with life two plus two before they have to move on to two times two. We need more focus on the skills that help them move up the stairs or they can slip up and fall behind. And there's another problem. What if everyone's stairs were made at different heights? Well, here we go again. They are. So, a boy in Seattle who's rocking an A in English literature could be getting a C on his Chicago friend's staircase. Oops. We need to create consistent steps in education too. So first, each standard creates a landing on the staircase a stop along the way as your child heads toward high school graduation. Each stop is a chance for every parent and teacher to focus on the skills their students are supposed to know at that step, no matter the zip code, language, or race. And more importantly, each standard makes sure all students are learning what they need to know to get to graduation and beyond. Because something like counting to 100 leads to understanding dollars and cents, which eventually leads to understanding how to manage a budget. Secondly, the standards are consistent from school to school, and they match up against international standards too. Now we know how we're doing compared to just about everyone. So even though local communities will still design their own curriculum, with the same rules, 
Everybody can compete on the same kind of staircase, but standards aren't learning. That's why we need teachers, parents, and students to help make that happen by working together to help kids meet these standards. The world's getting more and more competitive every day, but now, when our kids get to the top of their staircase, they can have way more options on where their life goes from there. Clear goals, confident, well-prepared students. That's the Common Core State Standard. So as you can see here, it's, it's really about a common goal. And I think that is part of the beauty of the Common Core, as I said, looking at the glass half full rather than half empty. Oops, sorry. So let's take a look at what these standards look like. So if we're looking at mathematics, there are basically four standards here in mathematics, and I am not the mathematic guru, okay? So I will try to walk <laughs> you through some of this. But they are basically numbers and operations, algebraic concepts, geometry, measurement data, and probability. And you can see in this map, now this is the, this is the Pennsylvania core map that they've put out on their website. You can see the grades where that begins to take place, okay? Now, as a district, our teachers are just learning. There are eight math practices that are involved with this. And basically, the premise behind um, mathematics is it's not just all about teaching children um, the exactly step by step as we all learn. This is how you do math. You do this step, this step, this step, and this step. I'm not saying that we don't ever get to that. But some of mathematics, it's, it's got to be about the concept. And do the, we really understand the concept? What do we mean by something multiplying? Not just the step-by-step -step procedure or the memorization of teaching multiplication, but what do we really mean conceptually about that as well? So the premise is around these four standards in mathematics. In English language arts, the standards look a little different. <clears throat> the standards are broken out. They go pre-K, or kindergarten, in our school system, kindergarten through fifth grade. And at that level, everything is supposed to be integrated. Science and social studies are supposed to be integrated, meaning that in science and social studies classes, children are to be writing and to be reading. And the, the standards are around these core standards, the foundational skills, reading informational text, reading literature, writing, speaking, and listening. Now, when I go to sixth through 12th grade, they're exactly the same. Because remember I said to you earlier, and I'm going to show you on this orange page in a moment, how the, the standards spiral across the years. So let's just take a look, if you would, at this orange paper. And on the front of the orange paper, you'll see at the very top, you'll see the pre-K right up in here, the grades pre-K through five at the very top. So let's just look at the top row with, where it reads, with prompting and support, retell key details of a text that support a provided main idea. Do you see where I am? in that little square. Now go across to the right under, um, that was the, the, uh, the pre-K. Now go to the right and read, with prompting and support, identify the main idea and retell key details of the text in kindergarten. Now let's jump that up to fifth grade, okay? Determine two or more main ideas in a text and explain how they are supported by key details and summarize the text. So I'm going to give you just, just 30 seconds to a minute, because what I want you to do is I want you to look pre-K, first grade, then kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third, fourth, fifth, and then flip the paper, and 6 through 12. Watch what that standard, that one standard, how it spirals from pre-K all the way up to what's expected by the time a child is ready for college and career. So I'm just going to give you a minute to process through that.
So do you see how this is part of the, the true beauty to me in the Common Core? Number one is that we have a certain standard, no matter where a child is in the country, of this is what the expectation is and this is what they should be able to know and be able to do by the end of, let's just say, second grade. But the beauty in this is the spiraling effect that things build. And I've never seen standards that have spiraled in this way across time, because it, it hasn't. Now, as you heard in the video clip, these are just the standards. This isn't the important part of the teaching that the teacher has to do, or that you as parents have to do to support. That's a very important part, but the other piece as a district is the curricular piece. What do we do with all of this? How do we put this into meaningful um, documents that our teachers can truly teach from, that our students can really learn from? And I'm going to show you as we progress through some of the work that we've been involved in here next year. But before I do, another thing that is a real beautiful piece of the Common Core, especially as a literacy <coughs> person, is that the Common Core spells out very, very clearly, as I said to you, in pre-K through five, the expectation is that as, as an elementary school teacher, they are teaching, they teach so many different subjects, and they've got science, they've got social studies, they've got spelling, they've got mathematics, they've got reading, they've got writing, they have all of these different subjects. It is truly meant that these things are integrated as much as possible. In other words, that children should be reading as much as possible in their science class, in their social studies class. Children should be writing. But it doesn't stop there. By the time kids hit sixth grade, if you look, there are also, in grades six through 12, there are reading standards in science and technical subject, subjects, and I didn't put them all up here, but there are reading standards in history and social studies as well. So if you look, site-specific textual evidence to support analysis of science and technical text. That's the sixth through eighth grade band. So that says to me, as a science teacher in the secondary schools, it's my job also to make sure that I'm helping as the expert science teacher in the room and the one who can read science information the best. I'm helping kids to process and comprehend that text. The other piece is the writing standards. There are now writing standards as well for science and the technical subjects, but also in history and social studies, that there are writing standards. We have never before had this in any standards in education. So I'm going to stop for a minute because I'm talking at you a lot. I'm sure, and we're going to go through some other things that I may answer some questions about how parents can support and some other things. But you see this spiraling. This is how every standard is, whether it's in mathematics or whether it's in the English language arts. They are spiral from that pre-K all the way up to that college and career ready. What things are pressing right now in your mind that you're thinking about so far from what you've heard or we've said? Um, are the social studies and science teachers going to have to sacrifice content in order to integrate That's a really all this great new, question. Um, new material? That's a really great, great question. One of the things with the Common Core, and I, I want to make sure that we're really clear in this, and, and for those of you who are educators in the room, and I know there's some educators in the room, this is not something we're going to do in a year. We've been working on this in Exeter for a couple of years, I can tell you, in anticipation of the Common Core coming. And our kids are not yet being tested Common Core-wise, except our kids are starting to take Keystone, but it's not counting yet for graduation, as you alluded to. That's not to 2017. But one of the things in the Common Core is that we can no longer in education go so broad and only an inch deep. The premise in that whole spiral <coughs> is truly that we go deeper within our grade level and not as broad. So you bring up a very valid point. So I'm a civics teacher. Where do I begin to sacrifice content, OK? When we're looking at this reading and writing standard, I think what's most important in this is that we cannot do all of the broad content any longer. But our kids have to have that depth of understanding. But I don't mean that the writing just has to be a formal paper. It's not just about a formal paper. Because there's one thing that we know is 
writing to learn is a very important piece. So it may just be a quick, okay, here's my civics class. And yesterday class, we were talking about um, something, you know, the, the, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. We talked about the Fifth Amendment in particular. I want you to jot down on a note card that you had out two things, two important points that we talked about in that. They're quickly jotting and they're writing, okay? That's a really quick formative assessment because you know as well as I do as adult learners, how do we learn? When you're having to remember something, I see a lot of people with pens in their hands. Why do you bring pens? You want to jot notes, don't you? That's writing to learn, isn't it? Okay, so those are the types of things that we have to integrate in the classroom. Some formal writing, but not these big research projects that we used to do that would go on for weeks at a time. Research projects, but they might be a little bit more short-lived. So in answer to your question in a nutshell, I think we have to go deeper, and there are some things that we may have to cut out, okay? I think we have to go deeper within things, but it's not just always in a formal way. Plus, it's also teaching kids to, um, to chunk information. I can't just stand in front of a class and lecture at you. I want you to turn and talk with one another. I want you to stop and write about something. And, and we can dialogue. Or come on in. Dialogue and help out it a little bit more. Okay. So great question. Other things that are pressing on your mind thus far that, we've, that I might have triggered as we're talking? Yeah, go ahead. Are we going to have to now um, in our district. <laughs> I would love to. Personally, I would no. I don't there's not even been a discussion because honestly, I think every district, as you well know, is hurting, you know, so much. We couldn't, you know, I think the big step taking on full day K this year was enough of a challenge, you know, probably from a financial standpoint, but we knew that there was really a need for that. Um, especially, and, and I know that Dr. Martin didn't make it because of the, the Common Core coming, but you know, I just, I ran a workshop this summer with um, some of our incoming kindergarten kids, and I said to the parents, think back to when you were in kindergarten. What did you learn how to do when you were in kindergarten? And one of the ladies said, I remember that time. And I said, Socialize. What? Socializing. Socializing. Yep. I remember show and tell because I was a product of the 60s and Sally Starr was really you know, big in the 60s. And I remember going in my cowgirl outfit, this shows how old I am, and with my cap guns. Like I had my cap guns in my holster. Now we could never do something like that. <laughs> so I didn't learn how to read in kindergarten. Did you learn how to read in kindergarten? Okay. No, you did. And, and even probably 10 and 15 years ago, kids weren't learning how to read in kindergarten. Today, you should see where we expect them to be. And that's not Julie Klein saying that as the reading supervisor. We know that kids are developmentally ready to learn how to do that. It, it is amazing. So, um, you know, really when we talk about that rigor, there's, there's just a lot more. So as, as far as pre-K, I don't see that happening. I, there's no talk about that from a financial standpoint. Yes, so with the pre-K in mind, um, knowing that next year isn't going there yet, but like kinder care, they have pre-K. Are they <laughs> going to be teaching to these core standards? Great questions, really great questions. Um, <clears throat> they are, and a lot of our area of pre-Ks already do. We have a transitional fair that the IU runs, Berks County Intermediate Arena runs every year, and um, I go to that, it's in the evening, and I take a couple of kindergarten teachers with me, and we share all of the information. This is what we are hoping that our kids that are coming to us in kindergarten are able to do. And predominantly, our local agencies right here are very much on board. I mean, I can tell you that the majority of our kids that come into K know, are able to identify all of their letters. It's because of our pre-K providers doing that. Kids can recognize their name. Had a kindergarten yeah. ready checklist. Yes, so a lot of our pre-K providers do that and we have a great, because of that transitional fair where we meet with them, we have an open dialogue with that and the IU is great about sharing these things. So really good questions. Anything else? Yes. Back to her comment, you said that in Common Core we have to sacrifice some of the control to so okay, some of the content. Where does that content being delivered? Is it being directed by Pennsylvania? Is it being directed locally? 
or the, want that content, want the change of the subject matter? Yeah, that's who's, a, who's making that decision? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, predominantly, like at the secondary level where you have your keystones and things, they're making a lot of that determination for us because when you look at those keystones, the keystone assessments that happen um, for our older kids, um, those, those keystones are really pretty rigorous. Um, and they can be very, very content specific. So really a lot of it, and you're gonna see I have a couple pictures, it's teachers sitting and dialoguing about that. They're looking at released items from the state of Pennsylvania to see what's there, um, and that scope and sequence, and then they're, they're building assessments and things around that, and then their curriculum is designed from that assessment. So it's really our teachers. In the video clip in the beginning that they, they, you know, they talked about, the standards are one thing, but it's our job to do the curricular piece. So exactly what you're asking, that's our piece to make those decisions, but we have to make wise and informed decisions it's by what the piece then. Exactly, yeah. A lot of it really, um, yeah, it does, you know, release items. Right now, the state of Pennsylvania has released items as well for um, the grades three through five, and I'm not exaggerating, they're 100 page documents per grade level. So it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the business we live in, you know, all of us, in your jobs as well, there's accountability, and it's the same, you know, in education, and unfortunately, the assessment is really our judgment, is all times our judgment. So great questions, yes. Um, you talked about assessment, and that, that's my biggest issue. I mean, I, I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. and last year I had to sign an affidavit saying I will not discuss what's on the test. I want to see my kids test when it's done and graded, and I went back and I want to see what he didn't do well. And I want the state to say, well, this was the area, or this was, no, I want to see his test. So I, I know, because I signed that affidavit, how do I go about seeing his test? Here in our district? I, I know it's not, I know it's not an excellent thing, but if these, if these common core, if this common core is so wonderful and so great, right. I want to see what's on that test. I, I, Parents ask me all the time, well, my kid didn't do it, let me see the test. I want to see my kid's test. Right, and I may have to defer to Dr. Davies, our assistant superintendent for this, but let me just try to, we don't even get, <laughs> we don't even get that test back. What we get is, is a score. And so, um, you know, even to be very honest with you, I don't know how it is in Boone, but we have been pretty stringent because the state has been so stringent in saying we're going to send people who are possibly could stop in and monitor while you're giving the test. So our teachers are not allowed to walk the room. So you're my students, okay, and I've spent a year teaching you and I'm very invested in your education and I am not supposed to walk the room and look at what you're putting on this paper because the state is very fearful that if I look at what you've done, I may be coaching you to say, you might want to look at number seven, <laughs> okay, or something like that. So, so we're not privy to that. The only thing that we are really privy to is those... Um, there's their, their score, their raw score, um, and you know the, the released items that they give to us. Am I correct, Dr. Davies? Is there anything besides that that I mean we don't actually ever see that test? Um, if parents have the right to look at the test prior to it being given, and you need to contact your building principal to review it, and then you have to sign an affidavit there too that you're not going to be sharing the information. That's not your son or daughter's score on the test. That's just that you agree with the content of the test. Um, and they're, they're not gonna give you the test back. I don't see how they could. You know, I don't, they can show you the score, but they can't show you a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the item and how your child scored on it because then they would have to throw away those items and they wanna continue to reuse those year after year and I mean, I've never heard of anybody getting information back from the state regarding that. I think that. And, and my question would be, you know, I've been in contact with my representatives. That, that's my issue with it. The Common Core is so wonderful, which in theory, what you're saying, and you look at this, that's great, right, but why is there secrecy? What are they putting on that test? Why can't I see it? I'm a teacher, and if a, a parent comes to me and says, I want to see a copy of the test that my kid just took, I, I give it to them, and if I have to make another test, then I have to make another test the next year. And I, I want to see the questions that he gets wrong and say, oh, well, he got the theme, he couldn't figure out the theme, okay. Well, then I know that, that, well, that was a tricky question. Or I look at, like, New York, where they had all these 
errors with grading the test. And I, and, and I just have, I'm an educated person and I, I want to be able to look at that test and see one, do I think it's valid? And two, where does that line? I don't mean to put you up, like I know it's not an excellent yeah. thing, but that, that as a parent is my and it is about, I mean, I can, I can tell you, I mean, the DRC, which is the company that we, um, Data Recognition Corp., which is the company that the state of Pennsylvania pays to write the assessments, they have spent millions and millions of dollars on these assessments, so that's exactly it. They have a, you know, a database, you know, to pull from, and they want to be able to utilize those tests. So those aren't even released to us, but as I said, the state, the state didn't even put out on the SAS portal, but they put it out on the PDE website, it's a little bit more buried, but they do have literally 100, it's a 100 page document for each grade three, grade four, and grade five that's been released items so that at least you are privy. And we in education who are trying to prepare kids have some, you know, something to go by. What is this test going to look like and sound like? We're very lucky in our district. We have a teacher who has spent seven or eight years working at the state level to help with those assessments. I've done it too. I did it last year. It's very, very tedious work, but at least gives you that little bit of little bit of scope into it. But again, we have to sign off going up there as educators to say, I won't come back into my district and share any of this information that I'm looking at from the test. So, the reports that the state does offer will show where your um, child scored relative to the standards. In other words, which standard or which anchor they did well on or, or otherwise. Um, so I think they give you, they do give you information with regard to that and, um, you know, I don't know how else to, you know, point you in, in a direction that could really get you the information. In terms of the keystone, they, I don't know if you can say they tell you you made eight of ten in this category, but I just got the keystone back for algebra and I think it just has the first two those two modules and it was just pass or fail. I don't think they broke it down in terms of They do. Do they do? Yeah they, they do. It, it's a see the keystone is different where you need to pass it to actually graduate. Okay, that's a graduation right. requirement. And that's another thing. The the PSSA stands for uh, Pennsylvania System of School Assessment. Okay, they're, this is a, a metric that they're using to evaluate us as a district. So as a parent, you know, I, I know that you're interested and you're, you're curious. I think that this is more of a, a way that the state can, can take a look at us and determine how well we're doing with the, with the instruction. So um, I think that the reporting and looking at you know, the anchors on those reports as well as the standards that perhaps your child did well on or otherwise would probably be the best information that you could use with regard to that. I, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer with that, but um, you had a question about the growth with, did sort of, I answer that specifically? Did I answer that question? No. Okay. So you're going to send the Keystone results out that they took last year? Oh yeah, they, they will come out. There will be a parent report um, with those results on it. You said the PSSA results. Yeah. Oh, the past, what, I'm sorry? When might we see them? Um, they should come out right around now. I mean, in terms of, depending on when your child took the test those spring. You touched on that the eighth graders who took the Keystone last year, it doesn't count? It doesn't count for graduation. Why? Because it's the Keystone exam. It's the exam that you know, they were right. in the high, high level, they're in the honors, and they took the Keystone. It, that it doesn't count for anyway, but it counts for the student bank, right? I think they get banked for the eighth graders. Yeah. Right? I mean, that that's the way it was explained. Yes, I guess it was sure, because my daughter's that's in the accelerated right. algebra also, and she said that they're taking the Keystone this it's year, and the rest of her class is taking it next right. year. If they've passed yeah. it, if they've done well, yes. that will get but banked. But they would have the, if, if right. they didn't pass it, if your child didn't pass it last year, they would have the opportunity to take it again with the rest of the grade. Exactly. They will, until they pass it. Well, but it is banked well, for that graduation. Right. But for our kids who are in the higher grades, sense. which I don't think we have many parents, you know, parents, but for right now, until 2017, <coughs> that's when the graduation requirement comes in. And I think to answer that question, the state is gradually kind of adding these things in, not just well, bam, slam, slam dunk. So. It's going to be a science element added as well. Bio, biology. Well, it's not just biology, there's also. Well, there'll be a physics, I think, yeah. eventually, and I don't know if that's by 2017. Um, I mean, chemistry, I believe, and there's also going to be civics. Civics is, yes. Mm -hmm. 
biology and then now. composition. Mm -hmm. So the, the state is kind of gradually adding these things, and it's it's sometimes I hate to say it, but a moving target with the state. They will change mm -hmm. things. Um, you know, we were supposed to be tested this year under the new Common Core. We're not. They've moved that back until next year. I prefer um, grades three through eight. So as we look at the shifts. I'm sorry. Before I yes, take questions. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I see your hand. I'm sorry. It's all right. Um, now I understand, like. Finland, South Korea, Hong Kong are the big dogs in, in everything. Mm -hmm. How is this going to help us compete or is this just going to measure what we don't know yet? Because if, if they're doing everything so right, how come we're doing all this instead of just doing what they're doing? Well, I think when the Common Core was written, and again, please interject, but I believe when the Common Core was written, they, they looked at all of those higher performing countries and really thought that the starting base had to be that we have to have common standards for all of our kids because apparently in those countries they do and that kind of exit criteria for a grade level we've never had that so to me this is at least a huge stepping stone for the united states of america to be able to do this because never in the history of education has there ever been a common core that has been adopted by so many states? There's never been a push for this. So they did begin by looking at those high-performing countries. Okay. Now, if mm -hmm. with PA, PA, Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania ICE. Right. <laughs> yes. Doesn't that defeat the whole purpose? Then that's a good point. Um, no, because they, they still took the Common Core, and what they really changed is not the content of the document. They changed the nomenclature, and the nomenclature is the numbering system. So when you look at your orange paper, do you want to look over your shoulder? I mean, that just kind of sounds like a money-making thing. I, well... I mean, everyone has their own little thing that right. wants to control it, as opposed to the federal government saying, this is going to be our core standard. Yeah. We all made this core standard. And, uh, yeah, and to be honest, I mean, your wife's in education. I mean, she can. You know, we all kind of in education kind of went. Why are you doing this? And I know people who were called to the state level, administrators, teachers, pulled into a room and said, "Okay, here's the Common Core. We've adopted it. Now we need to make it. it it's political." For lack of a better way of describing it, our understanding <coughs> is it's total, totally political. We don't have any local authority over that, except the state says to us, okay, this is what we've adopted, this is what we are putting out there. And so they've put this all out, and I'm going to show you the site um, for the state of Pennsylvania where those standards are. But in terms of the importance of the document, the content is very, uh, very much the same. And I can tell you that we took a lot of efforts. I've been working on this for two years, kindergarten through sixth grade in particular. We took a look at the, 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 the Common Core, we took a look at the PA Core, and we took a look at the eligible content, and we married that into a document. And there were some places, I'm going to tell you, that the state of Pennsylvania and those groups of educators that came together made the standards um, and the language of the standards a little bit clearer. And so we've utilized that. So in some ways, the state did a little bit better of a job of making some of the um, skills and things, just laying it out a little bit more clearly. The other thing that they did is, as I said, that nomenclature. Um, when you look at this document where we're looking at an RL, RL in the Common Core means reading literature, and it's very easy to read. But if you see on this document at the top, in the top right-hand corner where it has CC, one, two, PKA. That's the nomenclature of the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm not going to stand up here and pretend like I know how to read that. It means something in their document. But that's one of the things that the state of Pennsylvania did. So it didn't change the content a whole lot. If anything, in some instances, they made it a little bit better. OK. And I'm sorry. To no, please, that's fine. Me. That's why but I'm, I'm here. Reading, or hearing about in the news how Florida's pulling back now yeah. from this and other states are doing the same thing. I'm, we invest all this energy in this yeah. next new big idea. Right. And, and I, I would like you know, Dr. Davies to interject here because he's you know, the assistant superintendent and he 
you know, comes with a, a broad-based knowledge. But my, here's my, my own opinion on that. I agree with you, and, and in the state of Pennsylvania, some of it is political. However, as I started this, and I truly believe this in 31 years of education, I really believe in the work of this document. I believe wholeheartedly in the work of what our teachers have done in this district around this document. It is a good document. And I've been in education for, th this is year 31 for me, because of exactly what I started off by telling you. I'm a firm believer in the spiraling of we build upon a skill for children and it spirals all the way through. I love that the standards are consistent that if a child moves into us from a state, you know, from a state other than Pennsylvania, that, you know, hopefully they'll be coming from the same standards of teaching, so that we're really kind of talking the same language. So again, I think we can view the glass half full, or we can, we can view it half empty. And like I said, we have a lot of different things coming at us, but I see this one as a very powerful document I can't speak for Exeter School District. Um, you know, only Dr. Martin and our school board can do that, and, and Dr. Davies. But I believe that we, as educators, believe wholeheartedly in it, and that we will continue to move forward in this because it really is about teaching kids to do a lot of the thinking and processing on their own. It's about getting kids to write more. It's about getting kids to read more. Um, and so, I'm a firm believer in that. I'm going to take you through, and I don't mean to cut you off. You can please, yeah, go ahead. But now my question is, so our kids who are in, say, fourth or fifth grade, are they behind? Are they going to be struggling to keep up with these new standards? No, I don't think so, because I, <laughs> I think we have to view it this way, Robin, is that we're kind of all at the same place. I wouldn't view it that our kids are behind, because I think our kids, you know, we are truly a balanced literacy school district. So, you know, when I was talking with the one parent about, you know, our teachers just reading from a script, we don't do that. We have book rooms. We're meeting, we truly are a, di a district who differentiates for kids. So if I'm a third grade student and I'm reading on an eighth grade level already, what is the teacher doing in a guided lesson to make sure that they're meeting that child at their instructional level? That is an expectation we have in the district that we are trying to work very hard on doing, that we are really um, uh, meeting, you know, where kids are at this Is point. Is there still going to be room for that flexibility though? Because I just have a, a kids who went through earlier and later, and I'm just finding, like in multi-age specifically, they used to have differentiated spelling tests. They used to have, now they get a list of four words that we spend two weeks on foundations, and it frustrates her. Are we still going to have room? Is foundations going to be like the whole year? Is foundations is the whole year. It's a new phonics spelling and handwriting program that we put in. And phonics has a, it has a very different approach to spelling. Okay, it's not about here's the list, mom and dad, let's study the list, because you know as well as I do, a child can study the list, come in and score 100 percent. But that list is differentiated. Is my point? Like if you know, because what? it's not when the child is really tested on that. It is a test of is the child able to assimilate the skills that they're learning in the phonics work that they're doing, and are they able to apply that in the spelling test? Because there's spelling tests that they're getting to that are not studied oh. spelling tests. There might be words that they're practicing, but that's not the, the actual, because right. the spelling test is they're getting words that are cold, that they've never had before, because it's an application of the skill. It's an application of the skill. <clears throat> okay, so the shifts in mathematics, the, the blue handout that you have here, you'll see on the one side the common word shifts for mathematics. I just had this copied for you because this goes into a little bit more detail, but you can see that the shifts in mathematics are really, and again, I'm not, I'm not the expert, I'm not the resident expert in mathematics, but focus on the standards of mathematical practice, which very much involves this problem solving. So it's not all about teaching kids the procedure of a mathematical problem. Yes, they still learn the procedure, but it's really understanding the concept behind it as well. If I'm teaching multiplication, it's not just the step-by-step procedure for teaching that, or fractions and the step-by-step -step procedure for that, but the children really understand the concept behind this and the problem solving that has to go into that. The thinking, because it involves a lot of deep thinking to understand those mathematical practices. 
Um, the coherence in thinking across grades and linking to major topics. And again, these things are explained a little bit more here in, in the uh, handout. And then the rigor and major topics pursue conceptual understanding, procedural skill, and fluency and application with e equal intensity. So <clears throat> at this point, um, you know, the district is looking at some mathematic materials, um, you know, to really be um, delving in more depth to kids understanding the mathematical practices um, and not just the procedural skill. If you flip to the other side of the paper, it just tells you in the language arts area, the shifts in literacy. This is very, this is a huge piece in the Common Core that the shift is very much now around nonfiction. Just like I showed you in the standard, that nonfiction might be within the, the context of a science classroom or a social studies classroom or even a mathematics classroom doing problem solving, reading, reading a word problem. Um, so this nonfiction is huge and we need to spend a lot more time with kids engaging in nonfiction because we read nonfiction very differently than we read um, fiction. Reading, writing, speaking, grounded in evidence from the text. I can tell you in having looked at the new text, one of the huge key elements in this is that children <clears throat> will oftentimes you know, be given a text, they read it once, they think that they're finished with it. You know as well as I do as adults, especially when you're reading nonfiction, that oftentimes we have to revisit a text a couple of times to really understand the um, depth of meaning and comprehend it very, very deeply. So one of the things that I know that the Common Core really pushes for in the testing of students is that students have to go back into the text and draw evidence from the text to prove their point or to, to add in to their answer. So that's a huge piece. Um, as well, regular practice with complex text and academic language. And what is meant by academic language is um, there are different tiers of vocabulary. Our tier one vocabulary is just like I'm speaking now, very sim simplistic words. Kids just adapt to that because we speak to them. When we get to a tier two vocabulary, a tier two vocabulary is a more sophisticated language when we begin to use words that are cross-curricular. Um, words, maybe like management or um, government or something like that. And then a tier three academic vocabulary is really talking to con content specific, like in science, an isotope. You know, an isotope is a very content specific type of word. So these are just some of the, the shifts um, in the ELA, English <coughs> Language Arts. So this paper goes into a little bit more depth for you if you want to read a little bit further about that. So I just want to talk really briefly because I think when we hear about the rigor of the Common Core, I copied an article for you. <clears throat> I'm going to go into a little bit more depth, but oftentimes I think, as parents, and I'm a parent myself of a 21-year-old and a 16-year-old, and I sometimes think with my son Alexander, I figure, geez, he doesn't have a whole lot of homework. I mean, how rigorous are these classes that he's in? He's in some honors classes, how rigorous. Because I think sometimes that we as parents equate rigor with homework. So one of the myth, myths is that myth one is lots of homework is a sign of rigor. And that's not necessarily true. The second thing is rigor means doing more. That, you know, when we see our kids are inundated with work and have a lot of work that they're, they must be learning a lot more. Not always the case either. And then rigor is not for everyone. Well, you know what, my, my child just can't be in an honors class for this, or gee, my child maybe just can't understand this concept. And also here that when our kids get into, you know, things that are difficult, that we as the educators or you as the parent can provide guidance or support that that shows maybe a sign of weakness or a lack of rigor all myths. And so this article just kind of dispels some of that myth. Not to say that your kids are going to have less homework, I'm not saying that. <clears throat> but true rigor is expecting every student to learn and perform at high levels. This requires instruction to allow students to delve deeply into their learning, to engage in critical thinking and problem solving activities, to be curious and imaginative, and to demonstrate agility and adaptability. To me, it's not just about the teacher standing in front of the classroom lecturing every minute. It's really about having kids turn and talk and dialogue 
having kids read text within the classroom and what information did you get from that and jotting down notes. I said that writing to learn is very paramount in the Common Core. So <clears throat> this is just an interesting article. The state of Pennsylvania has put this out. It's on their website and I thought it might be a good one for you to just take a look at. So what have we been doing in Exeter? Here are a couple of pictures of some of our teachers engaged in some of the work that we've been doing here, as I said, for the past couple of years. And this looks very different at the different grade levels. You'll see in the bottom picture some of our secondary teachers who've been working on common assessments. And exactly, you know, like this gentleman over here had asked, you know, who decides the content? Our teachers do. We, as I worked with some of our civics teachers and our English um, teachers, um, at the junior high and high school. You know, it's up to we as the central administrators to give the teachers the documents that the state of Pennsylvania is looking out there to train them in what is called depth of knowledge types of questions, which is very much like Bloom's taxonomy, for those of you who are familiar with it, but to ask questions that are not just rote memorization questions, but questions that really have kids analyzing and thinking um, very seriously. You can see our elementary school teachers here to working on their ELA curriculum. So as I said, we've been embedded in this work for quite a number of years. So how can you help your child? And then I'm gonna show you some websites. I'm also gonna show you the Exeter website to show you some of the things that we have out there for you as parents. But how can you help your child in literacy? I think, first of all, you're sitting in this room. So it's very obvious that you're very dedicated to helping your child. And I think as you look at what I have up here, you're gonna say, I already do that, I already do that. So the biggest things in literacy are promoting reading. When our incoming kindergarten parents come in, I always say to them, I know you're gonna find this hard to believe, but the biggest thing that you can do for your child is read to them. Well, that's easy, most of us do that, right? That is one of the best things that we can do for a child. Why? You're building background knowledge, you're building vocabulary, and not to mention the time that you're spending with your child and, and that vested interest. Uh, but that seems very simplistic, but this is one of the reasons that we do read aloud in all of our K-6 classrooms, too, for a brief period of time, because, and I share with the parents, um, I share a book, Time for Bed, because that's all times as parents when we do read to our kids. And it's actually a poetry book. It's a big book that I share. And it talks about it's time for bed, little fold, little fold, whisper a secret, don't tell a soul. Is one of the pages, and I said, how often would you have a conversation with your child about fold? Did that come up in your conversation today? <laughs> no, of course not. But when we read books, you can see how that vocabulary comes alive. So one of the most important things you can do, asking your children about what they're reading, just the things that you do um, in daily engagement and talking with them. What can you do to help with mathematics? And these are basic things. You know, practicing, these are obvious things, I think, to you. The one thing that I did put in here is, how many of you are familiar with the Khan Academy? Okay, my father, who is a retired, said to me the other day, Julie, are you familiar with the Khan Academy? Because when Alexander has a hard time in Algebra 2 and you can't help him and Greg can't help him, did you ever think about doing that site? And I said, you know, I do know about it, but I really never thought of using it and showing it to Alexander. So I thought I would just make you aware of it because there's all kinds of resources and it does go step by step. But obviously, the first person your child needs to be asking for support is the teacher. That's what we're here for. But I just thought I'd put that in there as well. <clears throat> Take a minute to just look at this. So I want to show you some of the resources that are out here. And the first thing that I want to show you now, at the secondary level, for those of you who are secondary parents, I can't show you, I can show you some of the resources, but I'll show you some of the things that we utilize in the classroom. I can't show you the common assessments because I'm giving you the test that the uh, teachers have been working on to um, make it aligned to the keystones and things so that we're teaching the correct content. But I do want to show you some of the things that we do have out here on our website. Okay, so for our elementary parents, K through six, and again, I'm not really good at navigating with my left hand, but if you would come down to our main page and you go to the academics, Sorry. 
go to the academics and you can write down the language arts information. And then over here on the left hand side, you'll see all kinds, we have all kinds of resources. There are links out there and I'll get out of your way in just a minute, I apologize. I know I'm standing right in front of the board, isn't that great? But we have the English language arts curriculum. And what we've done out here is this is what our teachers have worked very hard on. So I'm just gonna boot up um, a grade level. I'll just, I'll choose grade four, for no particular reason. But if you look down here, what we've put out here, and this is new this year because we just finished this. And when I say finished, they're not actually finished because as I've said to all of the K-6 teachers, we have worked on this quite arduously, but it is a working document at this point because it's a written document, and you know as well as I do, sometimes the written plans that we lay out aren't always the best plans. It's when teachers begin to implement it and play and say, okay, does this standard work here and so forth. So you can see all of the quarters for all of the grade levels are out here. So I'm just gonna, going to click, I'll just click on grade um, for quarter two, and what you'll see here is we've taken out, our teachers have all of the, their document has all of the resources and things built into it. We've taken that out so that you can see as a parent, if your child, sorry. Oops, Todd, can you come up and just, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm, I, it's very hard for me to lift this arm right now. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I know, but I'm not, you want, you want hold on a minute, maybe I'm, What you're going to see in here is you'll see how the teachers have, um, for kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, how they have marked, how they have taken the standard and they've um, mapped it out for every marking period. And then you'll see I can statements embedded in there. And then it, the teacher's document actually has their resources and things for teaching in there. We've taken those out because you don't need the resources. But you can see across every marking period. Um, you can see across every marking period exactly what your child is being taught. That is better? No? That's okay. I mean, it may be a little bit bigger if we can just go to, you know, like. There's too many zoom options here. Yeah, there really are. I don't have to whip. Quick, over here. To whip. So what you can see in here is, thank you very much, Dr. Davis, is <clears throat> what we worked really hard on in Exeter School District is, remember I was talking about that nomenclature? So here, this is the RL, here you can see RL 4.1. This is, this is the common core nomenclature that's really easy to read. RL means reading literature, like you can see up here, okay? Fourth grade, first standard, okay? Here in the parentheses is the nomenclature of the state of Pennsylvania. Now, you could ask yourselves, why did Exeter, why did we make the decision to do that? And I'll tell you why. Because everything that the state of Pennsylvania prints out, or any materials that the state of Pennsylvania prints out, will be to this nomenclature here. Everything else that manufacturers put out there, you know, different companies and things, will be to this nomenclature here. So I just had a small, very small group of teachers who worked with me uh, for a period of time in laying this out for every grade level. Then we brought grade level teams of teachers together to take all of the standards, okay, and those five strands that I showed you in ELA, and then figure out what marking period, what, where does reading literature, where does this standard, does this go really well with this writing and things. So if you scroll down here, you will see across this marking period, what if I go into here, this is second quarter, so these are the RL standards, 
These are the RI, reading informational, that you see coming across the dark here, the reading, okay? So refer to details and examples in a text when explaining what the text says explicitly and when drawing inferences of the text. Here is my Ken statement, why? Because what's very important to the learners that are seated in front of me is they need to know what the teacher wants them to know, understand, and be able to do. So I can make inferences and refer to details and examples in the text when talking about nonfiction text. And then embedded in here, the teachers, as I said before, are all the resources to help have a teacher help to teach that. So if you scroll down, you'll have your writing standards in here, your foundational skills, um, and so forth. Foundational skills, speaking and listening for fourth grade, the standards for this marking period, writing, they're writing opinion pieces on topics or text supporting a point of view with reasons and information. And you can see how that writing standard is then broken down into introduce a topic or text clearly. But all of this is out on our website for you to see. And again, as I said, this is not a complete document. As I say to the teachers, curriculum today is live. It's live and it's ongoing as we do the work and we see how our students are doing with that work. So, <clears throat> so that's the K-6 level. Now, as I said, the work looks very different at a secondary level because, um, let's just go back here. At a secondary level, we begin with, we begin with um, the common assessment. And again, I can't show you those, but what we do have out here are some tools that we are utilizing in the schools to help students. Um, so if you go to either the senior high or the junior high, and you come down under academics again, student engagement strategies, you will see resources and things out here that your students are utilizing in class. So before reading strategies, during reading strategies, these are all links, vocabulary strategies, analyzing text structure, these are all different links that are provided for students and also parents out there um, that we're utilizing in the classrooms. So I want to show you just um, two more links, and I may not take the time, I'm looking at the time, it's 8 o'clock, um, and I'm looking at the time because I know that you probably have some specific questions, but this one right here, achievethecore.org, has documents that look like this if you go under the leadership portion of this, and I can, if somebody's interested in doing this, I can, I can walk you through this, but there are documents that look like this. There's a whole bunch of parent resources on that particular site, Achieve the Core. Dot org. And that's not the Pennsylvania site, that's just a site, you know, for anyone across the nation. But they have two-page and four-page guides for every grade level, and it's just a parent's guide to student success. And it, it, it lays out the English language arts, and then also on the second page, I just printed out the, the, um, the two-pager, there's a mathematics page as, as well for every grade level. So if you're interested in looking at that, the National PTA did that for parents. This is the site, however, um, that is Pennsylvania's site. This SAS that I referred to a little bit. Okay, now what just happened? <laughs> But um, yeah, no, but the um, PDE um, dot SAS dot org is where <laughs> Pennsylvania has all of their standards and things listed out there. And I, wanted, I did want to show you that that site. Um, but this is where the state of Pennsylvania has listed everything. And very interestingly, um, if you just go down to the PowerPoint here, let me just go down to the PowerPoint. I do want to show you this site because when you go out to that site, you're going to see the state of Pennsylvania still has everything like this paper. Everything's in draft form. 
And I don't know why the state of Pennsylvania has still done that, but everything is in, in draft form. Thank you. if you go to pdesas.org and you go here to the standards and then you just go over to the common core which is right over here can you see that on the screen and you click on that the lower part of the page all of Pennsylvania's documents are right there the other one is um, corestandards.org and uh, that one is just the common core for the whole nation. This is the site I would refer you to because this is what the state of Pennsylvania has put before us. Um, but you can see there are all kinds of documents out here. And remember I talked to you about the reading for science and technical subjects, writing for science and technical subjects. Those are all the documents for those teachers. So what questions do you have? I've given you a lot of information. I hope that I've answered some of your questions. But what other questions do you have? Uh, what's the difference, or how do these things integrate, of Keystone, Common Core, No Child Left Behind? Okay. Again, I know education does every 10 years a completely new thing to make sure everyone stays employed. But. Right. Um, I don't know if I can really answer that one. No Child, well, yeah. Well, No Child Left Behind is uh, the law that was voted in back in 2003. <coughs> Um, it was actually the revised version of the um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And they haven't really revised it since then. The keystones are the end of course assessments that are given to students in the high school. They're different than the PSSA because they are, they are only um, assessing one course. And they are being used to um, determine <coughs> as a graduation requirement for students beginning in for this year's ninth graders. So that's the um, No Child Left Behind. The uh, keystones are assessments that Pennsylvania uses. And the Common Core is really just a, a set of rigorous standards that was um, created by the, I think it's the National Governor's Council uh, some time ago. And it, it is just a, a, a national set of standards that um, states can adopt all of or part of, and um, in Pennsylvania kind of chose to do part of them. I think that they could, there's like 15% variance that they could actually. Allow to change. So and we, we adopted a good chunk of them, but the reason there's draft on these documents is that they, they haven't been a, a voted on yet. They are um, probably going to be voted on this fall, um, the Common Core Standards, as well as a lot of other things with Act 4. Those changes. So, you mentioned earlier in the beginning that the Common Core in 2017 is going to be required for graduation. So, the classes of the 2017. The class, the class right. Is great. So, how does Common Core and Keystone? Do you have to pass both to graduate? Why do we have all these different? Well, the Keystones are assessments. I don't mean to jump in here. The no, Keystone is an assessment. It's a test. It's like the. It's like, an, it's like an algebra one test, it's a test. And our assessments are aligned to standards and the keystone is aligned to the common core standards. So the standards that are, that um, Ms. Klein has been talking about this evening, those are the standards that the keystone assessments are aligned to. So the keystone is a test and this, the common core are standards that, you know, the keystone is aligned to, the PSSA is aligned to. Um, so are there gonna be multiple tests? Keystones? All these different things that you mentioned. Common Core are standards. Right. But they're, they are standards and they will, and assessments align with the standards. The standards are just what children should know right. and do. Guidelines. So are there, so, wait, just so I understand this right. So there's just going to be the Keystone. But there's PSSA for grades three through eight. And those PSSA are going to be aligned also to the Common Core. And then once kids hit that a certain age level, like Algebra 1, that's a keystone exam. Biology is a keystone exam. Um, literature 
right now is a keystone exam. So there's just going to be one exam for these Yes. Days. So it used to be PSSA, which you're familiar with that term, was um, all the way up to grade 11 that we gave, the state gave the PSSA. They no longer do that in grade 11. It's now a keystone. Now that keystone can come into play because some kids who are advanced take an algebra, take algebra one in, in eighth grade. And so if they're advanced, they can take that keystone right away after they've taken the course. If they pass that keystone, we can, it's banked so that that child, when he goes to graduate, he or she goes to graduate, has passed that keystone for graduation. Now when that child progresses and gets into 10th grade, they take their literature keystone and hopefully the child passes that. If they don't wow. pass it, then they're, sorry? In the biology. Yep, okay. They're taking, so biology now has also a keystone exam. Eventually, there will be a civics keystone, and there will be a chemistry keystone, and there will be a composition keystone. Those are not in place yet. So as kids advance <laughs> through the grades, as, as Dr. Davies is saying, they take the, let's, let's say the biology class. I've just taken biology. Now I take the keystone for it. Hopefully the child passes it because it does count for graduation. That's the importance of it. If they don't pass it, they'll receive remediation and things in that to get them to pass that because by 2017, any child graduating in 2017 and beyond has to pass those keystones to get a diploma. To, is that, does that make sense? But Clear. still, Grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's still, it, it's still called a PSSA test. Okay, it's just that it's kids advance. It's kind of nice, really. Rather than take a, a culminating PSSA test, they're taking it on. Okay, you've just taken biology. Can you pass? You know the content that you've just been studying, and it, it's rigorous. You were asking about that earlier. Those tests are they're rigorous because I I've, I've worked with the bio teachers on some of that, and it's like. Wow, this is this is not easy stuff. So, does that is that clear? You understand? Is it clear? No, but it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. It's not always clear to us either, and it's 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 changing off times at any given moment. Yes. So every student, once these keystones are in effect, then they have to take biology, and they have to take physics, and they have to take chemistry, even if they want to just do both tech. Well, mm -hmm. not, not physics and chemistry yet. Okay, biology, biology, they have to yeah, they take. They do now. They, they, they take biology now. It's, it's one of the requirements. We have graduation requirements here in Exeter, um, and we need to require, I believe it's three science credits um, for graduation in biology, earth and space, chemistry, physics, those kind of things, will, they're required for graduation. And now it's required to take, to pass the test to graduate. It's a, if you think about it this way, okay, it's the end of, you know, it's the, it's the final exam, essentially, right. for the bio, biology class. And, and like any teacher, whether it's a homemade um, final exam or it's a keystone, they're going to um, take a look at their curriculum so that it matches the, you know, where we're teaching what's being assessed. So it's, it's, it's going to be a two-way street there when you're looking at the content of the course. And so the, if you're passing the class and not the exam, and there's, there's, an, there's, issue. A, there's an issue there. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's an issue, definitely. Yeah. And this is why we'll it's look at that stuff. right. And it's really about that teacher collaboration. Going back to what you were saying, you know, who decides that? You know, the standards are one thing, but we have to design what that curriculum looks like, what that instruction is um, in the classroom. You know, that that is really going to help the kids, of course, to pass that test, but to really understand that content knowledge because we want to get them ready for college and career. And, you know, I mean, I could show you things that, you know, readability level on, you know, when we think of, okay, well, maybe my child isn't going to go to college, and that's okay, but even to enter the workforce today is a very different workforce than I know when, when I was graduating from high school. Um, <laughs> the, um, the literacy coach that we had showed our teachers, you know, if, 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 if a person is going out and, let's say, I'm going to work at Dress Farm, the Lexile level, that's a readability level, the Lexile level that you have to read for their manual to understand what to do in that job is at a very high Lexile level. Think about a mechanic. You know, just reading directions sometimes, I know to put a chair together, you know, like I got, 
new, new benches in my kitchen and just reading those, trying to read those directions. So this is all about college and career readiness. And what the Common Core did, those state chief officers, is as they looked at other countries and things that were high-flying countries, they also looked and said, okay, what is required of a college student or a person who has to be ready for a career in this nation, and they backward mapped it, and that's where all the spiraling came from. But it started at the top of the staircase, so to speak, and worked its way back down. So other questions or thoughts? Hi, yes, yes. Um, how much does it cost in a district to get this all implemented? <laughs> that's a good question, that's a good question. Um, well, <clears throat> in terms of, of doing some of the work we, you know, um, I, I can't say that we can put a dollar amount to it, but when you have teachers working on curriculum, some of that work we try to do over the summer. Um, and we did do some of that work over the summer, but there are times when we do need to pull substitutes in to do that work. We do that very intermittently because predominantly what we know is teachers have to be in front of the class. So we do that on a very limited basis. So can I attach a dollar amount to it? Not a whole, whole lot. In terms of literacy, um, we've purchased more nonfiction over the course of the year, but we have book rooms in all of our schools that we've worked on over the past. Um, this is year four, really, of those book rooms. So in terms of materials, right now, not a whole lot, but we are looking at math materials um, and, and making a wise decision about that. So I can't attach a dollar amount, but for every district across the nation, you can imagine. It's $1.2 imagine. billion. Dollars. Say that again. $1.2 billion across the country. $1.2 billion across the country. You know, and, and you can't, you know, the catalogs and things, all, oh, this is Common Core aligned, this is Common Core aligned. Um, <coughs> so, but we're, we're taking that very slowly in the district. And I think that's a wise way to look at it, because as you see, things are, you know, perpetually changing. I don't think, you know, as Dr. Baby said, some of these things haven't been adopted. Again, this is a very good curricular document, so I feel really strongly about what we've done in ELA and what we're moving towards in mathematics, because it is best practice. This is all, the Common Core is very research validated in truly what we know about students and learning. Can I just say something to yeah. that too? You're looking at a dollar amount. We are buying resources in mathematics, but we do that, we would do that anyway. You know, we have to always update our our, um, our supplies, et cetera. And, and you yourself, um, Ms. Hines, talked about you know, the balanced literacy. You started that in 2008. And that was prior to the Common Core even coming into existence. So Exeter has done a great job, well before I came here, in just implementing best practices, which does cost money to run a school district and provide resources for that. So when you're doing what's best for kids and best practices, it is aligning with the Common Core. So some of the things that, it, it's not a big shift in many ways for us here in Exeter because of all the front work that's already been happening, especially in the area of language arts. So the cost, I would say, and Exeter probably not so much in terms of um, materials because we were doing that anyway, and that's just kind of what best practices are. And the math programs that we are looking at, again, those are just best practices. Um, many of the things that um, Ms. Klein was talking to about these countries, Singapore, Finland, etc., the, they've read the research from adding it up and all the studies that the Common Core is actually aligned to and actually applied it. So some of this research has been around for 30, 40 years on how kids learn mathematics, how kids learn reading, what rigor means, what collaboration means in the classroom, how to present arguments and um, et cetera for, for students and what it means to learning. So a lot of it is just we have to do it. We know, we know what kids need and as a nation we have to, we just have to implement it. So, and let me just say this, you know, I'll get to you, but our teachers worked really hard, um, really hard. I, you know, am really amazed. Um, we all have a lot coming at us, we really do, but I think the stressors today of being in the classroom and meeting the many demands, um, and these, these are, to some extent, some different demands, you know, when you think about adding more nonfiction, when you think about meeting the diverse needs of learners, when you think about, um, you know, looking at mathematics in a different way, that it's not just all procedural, but it, you know, it's, it's conceptual and things like that. So we have tried very hard to do a lot of professional development in the district, and when we do a lot of that professional development, 
we really lean very heavily on the expertise of our teachers because we really do have an incredible, um, a credible, an incredible, strong and um, a strong work ethic um, of our teachers who've done hours and hours of doing you know this work, and some of it is a well um, above um, the day that they normally work too. So I, I really want to say that the teachers have, have really put a lot of time and effort into this. <clears throat> yes. Speaking about the math program, um, I guess one of the programs that you're looking at is being piloted in my son's school, and he's not in the classroom where it's being piloted. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned that he's using outdated material. I've been told that because they're going according to the common core, they're not even going in order in the book. They're kind of teachers, you know, pretty much pulling her own resources. Whereas other teachers are given material that does go according to the Common Core. Right. How is that going to affect the students that aren't in those classes? Well, and, and that's a good question. But I think you know the basic premise is, is as far as most districts, and I think you know I don't know how boom is on this, but. We're all, the teachers who are in the trenches doing this work are just learn, learning about those eight math practices and how you roll this out. So our teachers who are going through a pilot are you know, just getting new materials and learning some of these things on their own. However, as far as the concepts and things like that, I would think that the concepts are basically the same. Possibly the approach with the materials may be different. But I don't think it's a matter that a child in a grade level who has a pilot is going to be further ahead because of, because the concepts are basically pretty much the same. The materials and things may be different. The order that things are taught in may be different in a book, but it's not going to be a matter of one child or one group of children being further behind another group of children because they're in a pilot, they're in a pilot situation. I don't. Okay, I'm looking at the time and we have one little one who's fallen asleep. So I'm more than welcome to stay after with anybody who has additional questions that I can hopefully answer. But I really, I thank you for your time and coming out today. And I hope that we haven't created more questions for you um, in, in just our dialogue. But as we're figuring it out and working through some of these things in Exeter, um, we put as much out on the website for you. And that was the purpose of this forum, to just really inform you of where we are. Thanks to Julie for doing a great job. Does anybody have any uh, questions about anything else that or opinions you'd like to express about anything other than our focus topic for tonight? Yes. Well, you keep referencing the biology as a course. And I know reading the information on Pennsylvania's website, it's not just biology, it's going to be all right. Or not should not just be biology. It's supposed to also be a physical science as well. Oh, yeah. And so I just keep just say that the science element is just going to be biology. It's misleading people. Yeah, you're right. Um, we offer physical sciences in, I guess, ninth grade, earth and space, and then physics in 11th grade. Yeah, but I think when we're talking about right now in terms of the keystones, that's the first keystone that's coming into play. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but it's yeah. not. It's, a, it's an alternative to biology. In in terms of keystone? Yes. Okay. I'm not I'm not I'm not aware of that yet. And and I don't I I don't oversee the sciences and things, but I know I've been working with the biology teachers last year in building their common assessments. And I know that there are more that are coming, like I said, the civics teachers and, but and the, yeah, because mm -hmm. not everybody you know that not everybody will take biology as a science. It will in Exeter because it's a graduation requirement. They're going to do it in every school in Pennsylvania. Passing the biology keystone is a requirement for graduation. And all students in um, Exeter in 10th grade take biology. We offer urban space science in 9th grade, and then they have an option of taking chemistry or physics, and then we get into other types of sciences that are more of elective based. But every 10th grader, in Exeter and pretty much throughout the entire Commonwealth are is taking biology. They have to if they want to graduate. What grade do they start learning the sciences? Okay. We, we, 
We, we teach science in, in our elementary grades all the way through. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Well, it's more integrated <laughs> in our elementary grades. Yeah, it's more integrated, and that's one of the things, as I said, in the Common Core K through five, um, science and social studies is more integrated into the language arts. Well, we have FOSS kits for our elementary yes. programs, and the uh, um, through the junior high, junior high is more of a you know um, seventh grade, eighth grade science, and then we get into more electives. I think it's difficult for people, like I just know that they used to have tests, they used to study science, and I do understand and respect that we're moving to the common core and things are going to change. Now it's more like during reading time. But like it used to be that you had a science class, and in I know first grade, second grade, that doesn't really happen. You don't say, this is science class. Maybe one day you'll build a whirly wind and you'll make it blow and learn about wind. But there's not a test in science. And I think as for me, old school, what I'm used to having happen, doesn't have anywhere I go, oh, there's no science anymore, and I get scared. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, I understand Is that. that you know? I, no, I've, I've spoken to my son's teacher, and I've been told that basically she, it sounds like she's undertaking a lot, that she's going to integrate science and social studies into the language arts block, but there is no, there's, there is no like there's no time for science. Set right? no, for no no set set material or or time right? Right? for science. Sounds like something that she's going to do on her own because she knows that there isn't any. I'll have to take a look at that. I've talked to which which grade level? First grade. Is, I mean, my understanding is that the primary grades really have a very integrated they do. Have a program with right. science and social studies. I don't know if it's teachers working together on that. Maybe you can. Yeah, I, and it is an integration. And but when you're talking about a science test and things like that, I you know I can't say in a particular grade level. Oh yes, we give science tests or we don't give science tests. But we do have FOSS kits at the different grade levels. But in addition to the FOSS kits, if they're not being utilized, what we've done in the book rooms is we've in fact we just purchased additional materials that are nonfiction materials to support the themes of study in a particular grade level so that the child is learning about that content in science or in social studies class. Um, and not just because that's an expectation of the common core, but the, you know, the, the basic underlying piece of that is if you look at an elementary day and you break it into separate components, if we're breaking it out and saying, okay, every child has 30 minutes for um, science every day and 30 minutes for social studies every day and you know especially in first grade classroom 120 minute ELA block and then they have to have recess and they have to have lunch and they have to have a special in there um, yeah. and then math which is normally you know 50 to 60 minutes um, even 70 minutes in our upper grades like sixth grade you look at a day and the day's gone there's not enough time in the day to be able to do that. So very much the, um, and not, I don't want to just say the thought, but is the true integration. And, and, and even prior to the Common Core, we were doing that. There are some experiments and things that take place, but it's an integration of, as I said, one of the big premises behind the Common Core is a lot more nonfiction and reading through the nonfiction text. So is there science and social studies? Yes, our teachers have units of study in every grade level of science and social studies starting in kindergarten that they are really <coughs> teaching, but it is definitely a K-5 more integrated. Once you hit fifth and sixth grade, and even fourth grade and, and third grade, there in most of our, our, in our elementary buildings, there are blocked out times in the schedule, oftentimes, especially fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, I know there are. What's a fast kid? A FOSS kit is a science kit that has um, experiments and things attached to a unit. So let's just say the stu students are talk um, learning about um, the earth. There are all kinds of equipment so that they can do hands-on experiments. It's, it's a kit that actually comes with all of the pieces in there so that the teacher can do the experiment. And um, there's some texts that go along with that too. Any other questions about anything? Yes. Mine isn't a question. I just want to say thank you. I appreciate everyone for taking the time. Um, thank you. Um, it, it's, you know, there's a lot I don't agree with, but it's not an extra level. I've been very happy and pleased, and I think it's wonderful that you do these forums. And I just want to say that, you know, I appreciate that. And I know that there's a little, you know, dissatisfaction with me, but it's not extra. I've been very, very happy with the education both of my kids have had so far, but thank you. Thank you.
you're very welcome. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I to remind you that there is a board community forum on October 22nd. That's at Riften. That is a slightly different format. The board is there. There is no featured topic per se. You can be there, ask questions, make comments. Uh, that's on the 22nd of October. And just for my uh, point of reference, we tried to get the message out about this meeting in many different ways. So I'm just curious, how many people um, are here tonight because you got the email connected? Okay, I thought that, that might be it. Okay, and then there were other ways we got the message out, but we're gonna try and use that a little bit more so that your phone doesn't ring and you hear it's somebody from Exeter and you go, hmm. You know, I know That's you, only when it's your voice. Well, I, <laughs> granted. But uh, sometimes uh, an email is, is not quite as intrusive as, <coughs> as the phone ringing. That's on that point, did you send the emails out you know, like a week ahead? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's day four. Yeah. Yeah. You might have better you know, Okay, I will keep that in mind. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes if you send them out too far ahead, people tend to forget it. To me, I like a quick reminder, but we can, we can do that. So again, thank you very much for being here, and uh, have a good rest of the evening.